Hey guys, this is a new Frankie Scouse podcast and this subject has took a quite a lot of my time off and on for a good year now. The Bullenden Club ties into the conspiracies that we write about on the conspiracy site. Right, what do we know about this club? It was founded over 200 years ago and is an exclusive but unofficial all-male students dining club based in Oxford in the UK. It is noted for its wealthy members and originally it was a so-called cricket club but reading many links that is all just a front. You have to be invited to the club no matter how rich you are. If you accept you will have to be initiated by the members. There are only two tasks we know of. One is burning a £50 note in front of a homeless person. And another task is this Natalie Rowe video. And you yep. tweeted... Pigeon Gate. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to tell, because a lot of our listeners won't know this. Um, I'm going to set this up. David Cameron has been accused by Lord Ashcroft of inserting his penis into the mouth of a dead pig <laughs> as part of an initiation ritual. Natalie's not one bit surprised by it. I didn't think she would be. Um, I wasn't surprised because I knew somebody had gone on it was even worse. That was even worse than that. Tell us about what went on. I want our listeners to listen carefully to this. Tell okay. us about pigeon I, I'm gate. Quite, I'm quite weary of this thing. I don't, it's funny, I don't even like to repeat because I love animals. Yeah. And it's not a nice description I'm about to give. Um, but, you know, when I was hanging around with George and Christopher Coleridge was there and William and a few of the other bodies, and they would talk about what they used to do, you know, to initiate certain cat people in the, into the club. And it went from, you know, electrocuting somebody, and they'd laugh about who likes electric being electrocuted more than the other person, etc. But specifically, this pigeon incident that George described to me has always stuck in my mind. I didn't put it in the book because I didn't think anyone would believe me, and I didn't think it was something that I really wanted to repeat. But when the pigeon, sorry, the pig gate came out, I thought, well, you know what? I need to tell them what I know. And basically, what would happen, or what happened on this, on that particular occasion, from what George was relaying, was that would, they would take a squab, which I now know is a baby pigeon. A baby pigeon, yeah. Um, or baby bird, I'm not sure, but I think it's a baby pigeon. And they would hold someone. I mean, please forgive me, anybody that's listening, if it's... Well, we're past the watershed, disturbing. and it is disturbing. And um, I don't want to be pushing you. I did say before the show, I never push anybody. But this is no, vitally I'm important. It. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. going to try to explain it in the way that it's not... Uh, you can be as graphic as you want there. Too gruesome. Basically, the, the pig, sorry, the um, pig, baby pigeon's head would be inserted into the buttocks of whoever they chose, which normally was somebody that was new and younger and weaker. He was held down, and the pigeon's head would be inserted in his... In his rectum. In his bottom. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the thing is, the, the pigeons and the baby squab is alive. And it would be inserted, it would peck away and it, until it suffocated. And it would cause the person pain and also... And, and the, a lot of distress. It's disgusting. I hate repeating it. I don't think I will again after tonight. Yeah, and I don't blame you. And, but I thank you for for, for saying it. Um, it's just disgusting. But that's a kind of that kind of behaviour to me is psychopathic. It's, do you know what? Um, you, you took the words out of my mouth. To say it's psychotic is an understatement. I'm going to repeat what Natalie said, and then I'm not going to repeat it again either. George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, told Natalie that one of the uh, Bullingdon Club rituals for young members was that they would take a baby pigeon, insert the head of the board into the uh, the the incumbent the, the the guy who was being initiated they would insert the head of the board into his rectum until the board expired until the board died but what annoys me is it took ashcroft 
You see, Ashcroft can write a book about Cameron putting his willy into a pig's mouth. Yeah. And everybody can, you know, jump on that. And yet, had I come out with my Pigeon Gate story, what <laughs> did get now, in 2005 or whenever, nobody would have believed me, and yet they believe him. And I'm kind of grateful that he's written the book and he's mentioned that because it kind of opens the door for people to say, well, you know what, I can kind of maybe toy with the idea that what she's saying is true or I believe her or not. But if you can do the pig, you know, Pigeon Gate isn't too far away from that. Do you think when they were doing those disgusting psychotic rituals with the baby pigeons, do you think one of the reasons they were doing it was to compromise the person taking part in it, Natalie? Because if you do that to somebody and you photograph that and they might have even used the old, uh, the old video cameras we used to have years ago, you've got that person in a bind. You've got that person in a seriously compromised situation where you can hold that over them in the future. Do you think that had anything to do with it? Absolutely. And I can guarantee you that whoever that person was, or persons, because I'm sure it probably happened to more than one, they have photos. And God knows who he is or what he's doing in life right now. But I can guarantee you this, they have them in their mind. Because the last thing that that person will ever want is to have a photo released of a pigeon of his backside. A particular newspaper wanted, uh, approached me, offered me some, quite a lot of money in order to, they wanted to know stuff about David Cameron. I gave them what they wanted, because obviously there's certain things that I will not, I can't say out publicly, cause, but I get the information. They then pay you to, and then they literally pay you, and they don't publish it. They want it. Mm. Now, they take, that, they take what they know. Cameron probably will be told, yep, we have this on you, um, but we're not going to do anything about it. Natalie, you've summed the whole thing up. Do you know what happens? In a couple of years' time, the system, the agenda, wants Cameron to, to feck off. And by the way, P.S., watch this space, because in a couple of weeks, there was a minister that is going to be outed. I've been told not to talk about it today, but trust me, in two weeks' time, sweetie, somebody needs to, if, if they don't resign, we're going to have to ask why. Well, we'll watch it quickly, and uh, maybe you'll come back home with us in two weeks' time. Yeah, yes, it's going to be out there, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Classy bunch, eh? All the members swear a code of silence or use the Latin word or murder. So who are these people we know about that have joined the Bullenden Club? Here is a sample. the big deal you might ask yourself well you have certain people picked or the most suitable name is groomed that join the club in my opinion all are picked to fulfill a role big or small at one time or another I will give you one example
how come there's been uh, not a lot of talk about them in the press recently? Because I, I noticed this a few years ago now, uh, the Daily Mail published famously published a uh, picture of uh, Cameron in his penguin suit uh, as a Bullingdon Club member. Uh, but uh, I understand that actually there's quite a lot of pressure from the Bullingdon Club for the national newspapers not to allow these to appear in their pages. Why is that? Well, let me tell you something quite interesting. Uh, do you know... You know Lord Rothermere, of course. His son is currently uh, a member of the Billington Club. There's a, there's a nice little tidbit for you. And so uh, may, maybe that has something to What's do with that. Also, What's his name? What's his name? So Lord Rothermere's son. Son's name is Veer Harmsworth. Oh, Veer Harmsworth. And hang on, because they're the publishers of the Daily Mail. So maybe his son has had a word with Daddy and said, oh, we'd rather you didn't publish these. I, I can't say. I, I can't put up anything more than that, but if people want to make those inferences, they could be perfectly legit. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to work out that there is some type of corruption going on since the club was first founded, and that continues today. So who was behind it all? All clubs have members, but, but there has to be a figurehead behind it all. I know lots of you will be thinking that the Rothschilds are behind this. A powerful dynasty, no doubt, but to me that's just too obvious. And also powerful people, real powerful people, hide in the shadows. So for that reason, I do not think it is the Rothschild family behind us. One name that flies under the radar is the Astor family. Not a name I was particularly familiar with, if I'm honest, but some say is the most powerful bloodline out of the 13. Their history is clouded in mystery. From a Jewish bloodline, their Jewish origins have been hidden and quite a number of various ideas of the Astor's heritage have been put into circulation by the Astor's themselves. Yeah, so we, we have uh, wars that are, are created, manufactured wars. Then you got a lot of the, sto the storylines uh, I just laugh because they remind me of Back to the Future and Biff, you know. You have this, like Aristotle Onassis, uh, his family uh, was from Turkey, and he goes to Argentina um, as uh, about, I think he was like 19 when he went to Argentina, Buenos Aires, and he was washing dishes and, and arrived as a refugee penniless, and within a year, he was a millionaire. Um, and people say, well, he just worked long hours at washing dishes. <laughs> uh, what was their family involved in back in Turkey? Well, it was applying opium. And uh, there's a, a group of men in Europe that have made decisions, the Council of 300, 300 men, wise men, that for a uh, couple centuries at least have made the decisions for Europe and they decided which families would be allowed to trade in the opium. One of the families that they decided that they would allow to become rich was the Astor family. So we have another Biff in Back to the Future story where we have this guy, John Jacob Astor the first, and I sent you a picture of him. Uh, the, the guy was a butcher helping his dad and then he, he comes to America, and his brother in New York City was given a monopoly by the British when they were controlling New York City during the American Revolution. He, he was given a monopoly by the British to supply the beef for the British Army that occupied uh, New York City during the war. What a lucrative uh, uh, monopoly. 
And strangely, nobody ever wonders or questions uh, someone like John Jacob Astor about his, his British affiliations. You would think that after Americans had fought a war against Britain, that they would be suspicious of... Well, let me, let me back you up on... So what exactly is the connection to the Astors? Respected Field McConnell writes that David Cameron's in-laws, yes, you've guessed it, the Astor family, have film of Captain taking part in an act of which they used to blackmail him. The Astor family are, of course, a very old satanic bloodline family who some say are the most powerful of all the 13 bloodline families. Even the mainstream media were forced to admit that Sam Sheffield was a strange choice for Cameron. The following is taken from the Daily Mail. They write, Cameron, who had just turned 26, had never been in any doubt what sort of woman he was getting involved with. She was far removed from the mould of his usual girlfriends but he had seen something special in her. And now, following months of research and interviews with friends and colleagues, we can disclose how Samantha's steely resolve, plain speaking advice, advice, sorry, and initiative, if untutored political instincts have been instrumental in helping him climb the top of the Conservative Party. The story of a powerful woman urging on a brilliant young, young politician may have a familiar ring to it, but that's where the parallel ends. There's plenty more about Samantha Cameron links that are strange, but I will leave that for another day. Could the monarchy be behind this exclusive club? Maybe. It makes sense that royalty have dates on future prime ministers and politicians from all over the world. Not to mention having banking cartels and media moguls in tow. Crown land is some of the most valuable in the country. Indeed, the value of the Crown's urban property, £4 billion, is four times greater than the value of its rural land holdings. The Crown owns, for instance, the entirety of Regent Street, around half of St James's in London's West End, and retail property across the UK, including in Oxford, Exeter, Nottingham, Newcastle and Harlow. One of the problems with assessing the, the power of the royal family is that uh, there is no constitution, there is no uh, closely defined set of powers which members of the royal family retain. Uh, it's much more a kind of influence behind the scenes which is quite difficult uh, to measure. The feudal Cornwall laws allow the Prince of Wales to claim the money and assets of anyone in Cornwall who dies without making a will. Um, if they owe no money the Prince of Wales can claim that for himself he, he doesn't use it to put in his pocket, his back pocket, but he does use it to fund his own personal projects, his own personal charities, and to fund bursaries in, in, in private schools. Uh, we know that so far he's claimed 3.3 million pounds of other people's money. People have complained about this. Uh, the people in Cornwall have asked him to keep the money within the county, and at the very least use it for the, for the, the public spending and the public purse. He's refused to do so and ignores their request. Charles has long sought to influence many aspects of government policy. His letters to ministers had been kept secret by the Attorney General. There are the sort of general privileges of the monarchy and the specific ones. The general privileges of the monarchy are pretty, uh, pretty mind-boggling, really. Um, pretty much legal immunity across the board. I mean, there's been various sort of wranglings to, to make it possible to bring certain kinds of legal proceedings against the royal family, but it's pretty much de facto impossible. Um, and then of course there's the kind of specific um, privileges they have, which is we've seen with the black 
spider, the so-called black spider memos, when you look at what the scale of these letters, it is quite, quite worrying. For a long time there were suspicions that, there have been suspicions that Prince Charles writes a lot of letters to ministers and other people actually advocating his, you know, his opinions and putting forward ideas on how um, the government should do things and you know, how things should be changed. And these have gained the, the, sort of the, the nickname Black Spider Memos uh, because he's meant to go and write them late at night in his handwriting, which is quite scrawly. Ten years ago, 2005, the editor uh, uh, of The Guardian approached me and asked if we could use the Freedom of Information Act, which had just come into force then, to try and find out uh, what letters Prince Charles had written to ministers and what they said and what their response had been. Uh, so we pursued it uh, from then. The government attempted to keep the letters secret in the face of a legal challenge from The Guardian newspaper. But recently, the courts ruled that the government had been wrong to prevent the publication of the Prince's attempts to influence government. When the Attorney General, Dominic Grieve, in the last government, sought to veto the publication of the Prince's letters, he did so, he claimed, because they would be seriously damaging to his role as a future monarch. If he forfeits his position of political neutrality as heir to the throne, he cannot easily recover it when he is king. Prince Charles writing letters to government ministers is quite clearly able to get a hearing, quite clearly is able to influence policy. Some of the responses from government ministers which have come out have been quite sickeningly obsequious. Um, a clear fawning by Labour ministers um, uh, in some cases on leading members of the aristocracy as if Prince Charles has some right over other citizens to interfere in the political process. These letters were extremely rambling, they were very long and drawn out. He talks about so many things, all his, his kind of bugbears and, and his pet projects, everything from Irish jails to beef farming to herbal remedies to uh, military supplies. There's pretty much nothing left that he hasn't got to talk about. Government ministers were, were very keen and quick to respond to Prince Charles. Tony Blair became a bit of a pen pal of, of uh, Prince Charles. And I think the Home Secretary of the time, Charles Clark, he used to sign off these letters from your humble and obedient sir. So as you have seen, the monarchy certainly has the clout to dictate and blackmail clubs like Bullingdon and its members. My guess is that they are behind this, but you can make your own mind up. Two cases concerning deaths connected with the club include Bullingdon member Bartholomew Smith, son of a former Conservative MP who in 1977 caused a free car pile-up while driving his Maserati car. An expert witness at his trial claimed that he had been driving at manacle speed and was considerably intoxicated. After the club dinner, he killed four people, including Chelsea footballer Peter Hausman and his wife. Despite being convicted of dangerous driving, causing death, and having four previous driving convictions, he got off with a ban and a fine. Also in 1986, Gotterfield von Bismarck, who was the grandson of Otto, Prince of Bismarck, a diplomat at the German Embassy in the UK, and also Bismarck's great uncle and namesake, was a Nazi official who allegedly became part of the famous plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Olivia Shannon, daughter of the late Tory MP Paul Shannon, was found dead of a heroin overdose on, on von Bismarck's bed. 
Following Olivia's death, Von Bismarck was charged with drug possession and fined £80, whereas your average Joe would have at least got three to six months in prison. That was not the last time Von Bismarck would get the benefit of doubt concerning the law. In 2006, Anthony Casey, who was 41, fell 60 feet from Von Bismarck's Chelsea flat and died. Bismarck was not arrested and the police said there were no drugs around his flat. Nevertheless, the incident reawakened the so-called case from the past and triggered and triggered speculation from the tabloid press. Stories included an article from the London's Daily Mail that claims the incident, the incident was fueled by cocaine, fueled orgies involving several individuals. The coroner's report had found no alcohol in Casey's body, but did discover a significant amount of cocaine. The accusations of a gay orgy, gay orgy was officially denied by Gotterfield through the coroner. Dr. Paul Knappman told the Guardian that a great deal of sexual paraphernalia was discovered in the flat, including sex toys, lubricants and a rubber tarpaulin. So you have two members of the club who the rules do not apply to, even when it comes to death. More of a mystery of the Bullenden Club is members' names that are hidden. Names are mysteriously wiped off any pictures and there is the case of the photoshopped image. Time. Uh, it, it then led to uh, talk about the Bullingdon Club, and this was something that Peter Hitchens pointed out in the Daily Mail. Look at this picture of the Bullingdon Club. Ori initially, people were looking at the picture, and it was in the papers, but no one saw that we've got a, a lapel there on the left, and, a, and what looks like a, a yeah, actually no, on the right, and the left another part of someone's shirt, and the rest of them has been airbrushed out. So who else is in the Bullingdon Club? That's what I want to know. Now I did a bit of digging around on this uh, subject, and it looks like possibly Mark Thatcher is one of those lapels, but there, are, there is a, a real sensitivity about this, and uh, it seems that we've got something which is a little bit similar to this Skull and Bones organisation, which is at the university, uh, the Ivy League universities in the United States, where you can see uh, George Bush there somewhere, on the left, just the left of the grandfather clock, and of course he was in the same uh, organisation, the Skull and Bones, as John Kerry, Me personally, I think the images that are wiped out have connections with MI5 and MI6. Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond novels, was a member. Also, John Profumo was a Labour member. The Profumo affair was a British political scandal that originated with a brief sexual relationship in 1961 between John Profumo the Secretary of State of War in Harold Macmillan's government and Christine Keeler, a 19-year-old would-be model. She was also having an affair with the Russian spy around that time. In March 1963, Profumo denied any affair. In a personal statement to the House of Commons, but was forced to admit the truth a few, we a few weeks later. He resigned from government and from parliament. Also, I have a good feeling about David Dimbleby. It's somehow connected with MI5, but I've got no real links to back that up. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on the Bullending Club, and we'll catch you soon. Adios, amigos. <laughs> Thank you.